Uh, my name's Steph Price. I edit Red Flag, particularly the um, union and workers pages. Um, speaking today is Phoebe Callaway. Um, Phoebe is a member of Socialist Alternative. She's active in uh, Adelaide. Phoebe is a historian. Um, she's currently completing her PhD from which uh, she's drawn uh, for this presentation today. Um, Phoebe is also a member of the Public Sector Union in South Australia. Um, Phoebe will be speaking for a while and, and as has been the case for all the other sessions, um, there'll be plenty of time for questions and comments afterwards. Okay, go for it. All right. I'd like to start with a story about a young woman, aged 16, who was arrested at a rowdy demonstration of unemployed women in Sydney on November 14, 1930. In the lockup, a warder admonished her, trying to make her feel ashamed for behaving in such an unladylike manner. She was asked, what would your mother say? This young woman wasn't phased though. She shot back, you'd better ask her, she's in the next cell. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the 16 year old was Pat Devaney and uh, her mother was Jean Devaney, the Communist Party author and activist. Um, and that's just to give you a flavour of the defiance that uh, uh, was characteristic of the women that I'll be talking about today. Um, just let me know at the back if you can't hear me and I'll speak up a bit more. All right, so there's two main things that we'll consider in this session. Firstly, working class women have often played a defiant part in the class struggle. Part of what I'd like to do is celebrate some of them, the unsung radicals of the depression in Australia. These were women who saw where their interests lay, they defied the stereotypes and they took a fighting stand. Secondly, we'll look at how the Communist Party or the CPA tried to organise women during this period. I'm going to show how the CPA wanted women to be involved in the class struggle and how they appealed to women as workers and as class fighters. I'm going to argue against the idea that communist women were restricted to activities that revolved around their domestic role. As we'll see, during the Depression this wasn't the case. So there's three parts to this talk. I'll start with how the CPA addressed working class women. Then we'll look at women's involvement in two strikes, timber in 1929 and textiles in 1932. I'm talking about these two because I've done research on them, but there's plenty of other stories of radical you know, things that <laughs> working class women got up to. There's other cases you can talk about, I reckon, which should be just as important. So both of these strikes took place during the Great Depression, which was a massive economic crisis. About one third of workers in Australia were thrown out of their jobs and uh, so ordinary people suffered immensely but they also fought back. Women were very much part of the workforce back then. Uh, some industries like textiles, clothing, uh, food preserving for example all relied on young women's labour in particular. By the 1920s, young working class women were expected to go to work for a few years between um, the end of their schooling and marriage, basically. Uh, their wages were low. Women's wages were generally half of men's. The CPA recognised that women were part of the workforce and they saw that regardless of whether they were in paid work or not, women were half the working class. The Communist Party, of course, saw the working class as the uh, group that would totally transform society. They argued that workers would overturn capitalism through a revolution and start running the world for human need, not for profit. For this to happen, as the CPA knew, women have to be part of it. And in the 1920s, there were major barriers to women and particularly working class women getting involved in uh, political activity. Of course, there were the sexist attitudes that were really pervasive before the women's liberation movement kicked off in the 1960s. But that was only part of it. Most working class women were really ground down by domestic drudgery. Um, for instance, ordinary women had to spend hours and hours, I think daily, um, doing washing, like boiling it and scrubbing it in um, coppers, like these you know, big copper pots. Um, so some women nevertheless def defied all this um, and became leading activists. So in that era, people like Joy Barrington and Hetty Wetzel, um, for instance. So they were pretty exceptional. I think it's fair to say that um, most working class women were not very politically conscious back then. Um, people can dispute that if they want. Um, the CPA saw the lack of class consciousness among working class women as a problem though, and they tried to do something about it. 
From 1927, the Communist Party made concerted efforts to uh, convince working class women that they should uh, take an interest in the class struggle and that they should be part of fighting back against the bosses. The CPA said that the main reason that women were paid only half of men's wages was because they were unorganised. They needed to get organised at work. And they argued that housewives who were reliant on a man's wage uh, to them, that they had a vital interest in their male counterparts taking a fighting stand for better wages and conditions. Communists urged women to join the CPA to be at the forefront of the fight back. So in making these arguments, they were appealing to women as workers and as class fighters, and they did so consistently throughout the Depression. The Communist Party addressed women specifically uh, through their publications for a start, and Workers Weekly was the main one. Uh, later it changed its name to the Tribune. And so that's just to give you a few examples, um, if people can see the slides, about um, the sort of articles it ran about uh, women's working conditions in various industries. So you can see from rubber to um, printeries through to you know, um, boot factories, waitressing. Um, there's a thing that says, uh, women's place led us to it, just kind of arguing, um, well, you know, um, uh, women are lucky their place is in the home. Well, you know, actually some of us work, you know. Um, so our place is fighting the boss is the, the last line of that um, one. Yeah, so um, it encouraged, um, the Workers Weekly encouraged women like their male counterparts to fight the bosses and it cheered them on when they did. Uh, Communist Party women formed study circles to educate themselves about politics and theory and from 1927 to 1930 they ran militant women's groups. And what these groups were about was explained in a paper that they published from November 1928, The Woman Worker. Uh, pretty fabulous mastheads, I reckon, those hand-drawn things. Um, so um, I'll quote from its first edition. Only the overthrow of capitalism, the shattering of the whole foundation on which it rests, will free woman from her present position. For this end, women of the working class must work hand in hand uh, with the class conscious vanguard of the men workers. That is the purpose and meaning of the militant women's groups. Our slogan for women is into the class struggle and they put that last bit in capital letters. The militant women's groups also aim to recruit women to the CPA. Initially the Sydney militant women's group described itself as a section of the communist party to which uh, non-party women are admitted. Uh, soon it became reluctant to highlight this link to the CPA to new potential recruits, but even then, most of the women who were involved were members of the Communist Party. Um, militant women's groups formed in Sydney, then Brisbane, um, on the New South Wales coalfield, starting with Cessnock, uh, and then in Melbourne and Broken Hill. These groups thrived in the major class battles at the start of the Depression, and each group had, I reckon, probably about a dozen activists. The militant women's groups urged women to be active in their unions if they were in paid work. And they encouraged their members to develop their writing and public speaking skills. So they gave lectures at their own meetings, uh, they chaired communist party meetings, they spoke at rallies and union meetings whenever they could, uh, and they wrote for both Workers Weekly and uh, their own paper, Woman Worker. In 1927, they also produced a 16-page pamphlet, uh, Woman's Road to Freedom, which apparently sold over 700 copies in a week. Um, and later in the 30s, communist women organised a bit differently um, through a woman's, uh, women's department instead of the militant women's groups. Um, they put out another pamphlet in, in that guise, I suppose, in 1933. Um, and I've actually got a copy of each of them, um, which I can just circulate to give you a, a bit of an idea. Cool. So, um, it's not widely known, but the um, militant women's groups introduced International Women's Day to Australia. They were the ones who organised the first IWD demonstrations in Sydney. Um, the demonstration on March 25th, 1928 is usually thought of as the first IWD in this country, but actually the militant women's groups uh, uh, group in Sydney at that stage held um, events a year earlier. In May, not March, 1927, they held a week of events which they thought of as their International Women's Day celebrations. 
Uh, they acknowledged that they'd been behindhand in their words um, in not holding something in March, but they didn't want to wait a whole other year, I think. Um, so the CPA devoted the third week of May 1927 to a Women's Recruiting Week. And they capped it off with a rally in Sydney's domain um, and a meeting in the Communist Hall on Sunday the 22nd of May. The militant women's group uh, made a banner for that occasion that they also used for the May Day of that year. Uh, the events on Sunday of their Women's Recruiting Week were like International Women's Day in that um, they were celebrating the achievements of the women's movement and raising demands for equal rights. Not as many women actually joined the Communist Party that May as they might have hoped, but they considered that they'd successfully introduced the militant women's group to the um, working class of Sydney by promoting it everywhere, and they also rated their rally and meeting as very successful. The demands they raised for IWD in 1928 were equal pay for equal work, an eight hour day for shop girls, no piecework, the basic wage for the unemployed and annual holidays on full pay. Um, and I've got pictures of the third one, also in Sydney, um, in uh, March 6, 1929. So that's in Belmore Park. Um, hopefully you can see uh, Jean Thompson in full flight there in the middle of the speech. Um, so the key political question of the day was the timber workers' strike, and it was also the main thing that the militant women's group was involved in at the time. Uh, so let's now turn to that. The timber workers' strike was one of three major industrial battles in Australia at the start of the Depression. When it became clear in the late 20s that the economy was going downhill, the bosses, then as now, uh, wanted workers to pay for it. So the Conservative Bruce Page government changed the laws uh, amending the Arbitration Act and the Crimes Act to bring in very punitive measures against workers who uh, were fighting for their rights. It also stacked out the Arbitration Court with known right-wingers as judges, all of this to pave the way for attacks on the most unionised workers, well, you know, to start with, and then everybody. Um, the waterside workers were the first in line. In late 1928, they fought against a very unjust new award, um, and I don't have time to go into specifics, but they fought, but they were smashed. Then the timber workers, who were also well organised, were next. At the same time as the timber dispute, the northern New South Wales coal owners locked out uh, the coal miners when they wouldn't accept wage cuts. All three were hard fought battles and the timber and mining disputes in particular were very long running. They were nine months and 14 months respectively. All of them ended in bitter defeats for the workers. And there's a lot to say about the lessons of those battles, but that really is a story for another day. Um, that's the depressing stuff. We get to look at the inspiring stuff, um, the spirited intervention of the militant women in the um, timber strike. So first, a very brief outline. The big issue in the timber strike was working hours. Um, it was a fight against a new award known as the Lucan Award after the judge that handed it down. Uh, which uh, the Lucan Award stipulated a 48 hour week. So basically the bosses wanted the 48 hours and the workers wanted the 44 hours that they'd been working for several years. They wanted to stick with that. The labour movement saw this quite rightly as um, a battle for the whole working class. The main places it was fought out was in Sydney and Melbourne where timber was processed for the construction industry and so on in large sawmills. Um, usually located near the waterfront like this one in um, Glebe. The strike began in February uh, with about 3,000 out in each city defying the new award. Timber workers picketed the mills um, but the bosses were able to bring in scab labour. In Melbourne the bosses brought on a crisis by shutting down the whole building industry. You can see a you know, building site that's just um, not working there. Um, and so the strike finished up at the end of June in Melbourne. But in Sydney, a stalemate dragged out for months and the strike didn't end until October. Women from the Communist Party working through the militant women's groups were involved from the beginning. They started up relief committees, uh, which involved many women beyond their own ranks, uh, mostly the strikers' wives. 
In Melbourne, they got about 150 women to an initial meeting about how to organise relief. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how many were organised on an ongoing basis, but a lot of people would have been needed to, um, you know, to keep up weekly food relief for the families of all of those people who were involved um, in the strike. So sometimes women's activity in supporting strikes by men through relief committees and so on is dismissed as being a bit secondary, you know, um, it's looked down on. But I'd argue that this activity was, well, A, quite important to keeping the strike going, and B, it was inherently political, right? Sustaining a strike is uh, taking a stance that defies the bosses, and in this case also, you know, defying the arbitration court. Uh, another thing that's sometimes said about um, is that women's participation was restricted to activity that related to their traditional domestic role. Um, and it is an easy case to make about food relief. Historian Joy de Moussey argues this about the 1929 timber strike. But it's a claim that doesn't stand up to scrutiny because the women's strike support activity wasn't limited to relief committees. The Sydney Militant Women's Group organised various rowdy protest actions, um, sometimes on their own, others in conjunction with other groups, and they made um, quite good headlines, I reckon. Um, my personal favourite is <laughs> Screaming Strikers' Wives Raid Peace Conference, and smaller <laughs> on down there you say, uh, Police Eject Angry Amazons. <laughs> yeah. So um, their defiance is pretty inspiring, but um, more than that, their protests had a political point, which was opposing the boss's narrative about the timber strike and about um, industrial relations more broadly. So on two occasions, they attacked events arguing for industrial peace. In the late 1920s, when employers in Australia wanted to get rid of arbitration so they could ride roughshod over workers' rights, the spin they put on it was along the lines of, oh, wouldn't it be so much better if we could just all get together around a round table um, and work out agreements without worrying about all this expensive court processes? Okay. Does this kind of sound familiar to anyone? Like, it reminds me of current phrases like, we need a mature conversation, you know, it's like when they want to pave the way for attacks. Okay, there's, you know, that ideology surrounding it. Um, so in 1928, the peak bodies of the bosses had convinced the ACTU and other Trades and Labor Council type heads to come together for a Peace in Industry conference. Uh, this caused debate in the labour movement, with uh, the left arguing that no union reps should attend unless the bosses stopped attacking the timber workers and repealed all the anti-worker laws and so on. Um, but despite votes against participation at various levels in unions, the Industrial Peace Conference met in Sydney in early 1929. The militant women's group and the strikers' wives were having none of it. On February the 20th, a group of about 60 marched to the town hall and they demanded to see the union representatives. When their requests were ignored, they marched through the building chanting, we want garden, we want crofts. So those are the names of the union reps. Um, and then six of them swept past security, uh, got into the gallery where the conference was meeting in camera, um, you know, so secret proceedings, and they caused quite a ruckus, just the six of them. Um, when police were called, they left rather than risking arrest. They rejoined the others and they all marched out together, uh, singing Solidarity Forever. And, it, you know, they'd made their opposition to the proceedings quite clear. Um, and that's what inspired that headline. Um, the Peace and Industry Conference collapsed soon after. Uh, it just wasn't viable for even the most conservative of labour movement leaders to um, take part in such an exercise when the bosses were so blatantly on the attack. Um, the protest probably helped bring the conference to an early end. A little later, Adela Pankhurst Walsh, who was once a union activist, but by that stage she'd ratted on the labour movement. Uh, well, she tried to organise a women-only meeting uh, of her group, the Industrial Peace Association. The meeting's aim was to convince timber workers' wives that the men should end the strike. The militant women's group worked with the Timber Workers Union and left-wing Labor Party women to wreck this effort. So on March 19th, a large number of uncompromising, defiant women stacked out this meeting and they sure weren't going to be bullied into being polite. 
So they didn't give any of the ladies who uh, appeared on the platform a chance to get a word in. Uh, they howled them down, they chanted, they sang solidarity forever um, so that the speakers couldn't be heard and eventually the people trying to convene the meeting just gave up. Um, so the Peace Association meeting broke up and the militants started their own meeting in the hall. Um, uh, someone described as a girl in her early teens got up on a chair and called out, come on timber workers wives, let us show them how we can run a show. We don't scab on our men and don't want to. Um, so the caretaker of the hall decided that this was all a bit much and he turned out the lights to force them um, out of the hall. So um, the working class women heckled these well-to-do industrial peacemongers um, as they walked away from the hall too. Uh, another time they paid a visit to the Timber Combine office, that's the boss's organisation. So on the 8th of May, 20 to 30 women stormed into the, um, uh, the office looking for Mr Cork, who was the head of the Combine. Earlier that afternoon they decided to take Cork to task over his statements to the press. Uh, Cork was saying that the men wanted to go back to work, which uh, the strikers' wives considered an, an outrageous lie. Um, so they set out to walk to the meeting, um, uh, from the meeting rather, to that office. Um, so usually they'd walk to save money. But one of them said, well, why should we walk when the bosses all take cars? So they jumped on a tram and refused to pay the fare. They said, send the bill to the government. Um, <laughs> they burst into Cork's office and confronted him over his part in the dispute. They asked him, how would you like to work for 48 hours in a timber yard? and why do you not give your workers a decent living wage? Um, so this left Cork very, quote, very pale and shaky. Um, and they were too quick for the cops. When the police arrived, they'd already left the building. Militant women's group members also joined in the picket lines and some of them got arrested, but they certainly weren't the only uh, women to display hostility to the scabs. One woman living near a mill in Sydney threw her dirty washing up water over the scabs on several mornings. Um, some thumbed their noses and yelled insults at them from their front yards and others spat at them over fences. Um, and at least two women even got arrested and hauled before the courts just for yelling insults at the scabs. Like they didn't, they literally didn't leave their own front yards. Um, so let's look at what the Melbourne Militant Women's Group got up to on February 19th, 1929. About 15 women went to the suburb of Caulfield to pick at Chitty's Mill. They called out things like, you dirty scabs, we'll give you what's coming to you when you come out. Um, <laughs> and they had a go at someone loading timber onto a truck. And he told them that he was a plain clothes constable, not a scab. And uh, Sarah Barker, according to this cop, replied, quote, you dirty mongrel, you're worse than the scabs themselves. <laughs> Of course, he arrested Sarah, um, <laughs> and um, she was president of the Melbourne Militant Women's Group, and that's when the fun started. Um, a fight broke out between him and the women, um, uh, some of whom hit him over the head with umbrellas. And uh, Sarah actually escaped that day thanks to the interference of the other five women. It took four constables to arrest the five others. And the cops were actually quite rough. One of them, May 80, ended up with a fractured rib. But the five women continued to resist arrest on the way to the police station. They faced charges of offensive behaviour and obstructing police, and 80 was charged with assaulting a police officer. Now, these women stayed defiant in response to the charges against them. Four of the six refused to pay fines. Union policy at the time was not to actually pay any fines associated with charges like this, um, but to do jail time instead. And three of them were jailed as a result. Sarah Barker and Mary Wilson, who was the Militant Women's Group Secretary, both served two weeks. And May 80 faced six weeks. And she stood firm, even though she had five children to care for, and she was still suffering the effects of her injuries. She was actually let out after one week, but her treatment in jail amounted to calculated brutality, according to the Timber, Worker, Timber Workers Union Journal. Um, she was subjected to bullying, poor food and nagging. 
and Eileen Egan refused to be intimidated at the prospect of imprisonment, even though she was pregnant with her first child and at the time of sentencing was due within a fortnight. Um, so, yeah, Eileen's impressive stance meant that her fine was waived because, as Workers Weekly put it, the authorities were not prepared to face the music of jailing her. Mm. Uh, so these were tough, defiant women. After she was released, Sarah Barker addressed a mass meeting of strikers and argued workers would never get anywhere if they were afraid of jail. Workers Weekly celebrated their courageous stance, counting them among the countless heroes of the working class movement. Um, and I certainly agree with that sentiment. Um, let's now turn to the textile strike of 1932. This was a strike led by young women. Um, first, a few quick facts. Uh, the terms textiles and clothing are often used quite interchangeably, but I'm talking about uh, textile mills where raw wool was turned into fabric. Um, this took numerous processes uh, involving big machines in large factories. So um, that's, uh, to give you an idea of the scale, if people can see this, um, this one here is a mill in Launceston. See those little dots down the bottom there? Okay, they're cars, right? Okay, so big facts. Um, so yeah, hundreds worked in them. Um, and about 60% of textile workers were female and 40% were male. And it was a mostly young workforce. So nearly um, half the workers were women aged under 30 years old. And although it was the middle of the depression, textiles was recovering. And yet the arbitration court ordered textile workers to take a wage cut, 15% in Victoria and 10% in Tasmania in the middle of 1932. And this was their third wage cut in 18 months. So this made the textile workers pretty angry. Their wages were already low um, and they had underlying complaints about their working conditions. In the Depression, um, their wages, even of you know, young women, teenagers, um, might have been the only income for their whole family. So this wage cut sparked a strike. The defiance of the young women really stands out in this strike. It started off in Melbourne uh, with wildcat strikes, so union officials weren't consulted in advance, right? Um, uh, wildcat strikes at three mills. The first was on August 10th, when 700 workers walked out at Yarra Falls Mill in Abbotsford. And their boss quickly agreed to halve the wage cut, and they returned to work the next day. Workers from two other mills uh, followed their example and won the same concession. At one of them, Lincoln's in Coburg, three young women tried to uh, shut off the mill motors to force a stop work meeting. So um, this was very dangerous and incredibly daring. Um, and of course, they were instantly sacked. But their co-workers stood up for them and they won their jobs back the next day when they struck. Um, so they won their jobs back and they got you know, the wage cut halved. Uh, then in Launceston, workers from all the major mills walked out together on August 22nd, um, so that's about a thousand of them. Um, you can see them there, they're on the grass, literally as well as figuratively, and um, yeah, and picketing there outside uh, Patton and Baldwin's. Um, so yeah, they demanded that the wage cut be cancelled completely. Um, it was the first major strike in textiles in Victoria and the first ever in that industry in Tasmania. It lasted for a week in Melbourne and nearly three in Launceston. Um, that's another scene of the strikers, um, Launceston and Melbourne. Um, yeah, women and men alike came out, but um, young women were the leaders. Uh, now, for workers in Launceston to strike, they had to defy their local union officials. And in particular, the secretary of the Textile Workers Union Tasmanian branch, Cyril Smith, used every trick in the book to uh, try to prevent strike action. At two mass meetings, he urged workers to delay their decision about whether or not to strike uh, until next week. And he even visited one mill to speak to those workers separately. And along with the manager, uh, tried to convince them not to strike. But Smith didn't convince them. At both mass meetings, there was an overwhelming uh, vote in favour of the strike. And all reports point to um, young women being prominent in the meetings. Um, 
And there's only one aspect of this strike actually that they weren't so prominent in, and that was the formal leadership of the strike. So, like um, the un uh, union committee, the um, strike committee in Launceston, um, 18 members strike committee, and there were three women. But otherwise, women were in the forefront. Um, this year, I'm pretty sure that's a picture of a member of the strike committee. That's um, E. Clark. Yeah. So it's either her or Rally. It's probably Emmy Clark, though. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the women's prominence was noted by observers, like the Queen's Council uh, Combined Unions um, uh, Secretary, you know, sent a donation to the strike fund and um, the note that was with it commended the girls in particular for the stance that they've taken. Um, Oh, it's worth saying too, not every um, union official uh, in the uh, Textile Workers Union chaired the attitude of Cyril Smith. Um, for example, the Federal Secretary of the Union, George Edgar Russell, travelled from Sydney in order to um, help the strikers win. So textile workers were determined to fight the wage cut. Um, they were equally determined that no one would undermine their stance. Launceston's young women in particular proved their determination at the end of the strike's second week. Two young men, one on a bicycle, approached a mill intending to uh, cross the picket line. Um, when the first one got close, um, picketers knocked him off his bike. A cop came over to help this would-be scab um, and found him, quote, on the ground and one of the girls was hitting at him with a rope. Uh, then the cop tried to force a way through the picket line for the boy, but the picketers surged around and knocked both of them to the ground. The cop swung his handcuffs around and hit at least two young women, but they successfully held the line and the boy on the bike gave up and went home. Um, meanwhile, his mate had taken one look at how they dealt with him and he'd thought better of it. Um, <laughs> and no others dared try cross that picket. Um, so, of course, you can imagine the mainstream media went nuts about all this. You know, um, they derided the strikers as foolish young women and irresponsible girls, but the communists loved it. Um, the CPA wasn't very influential in this strike, but I want to talk about what they did because of the effort they put in, even though they didn't have members in textiles in those places. As soon as they realised there was some anger around the wage cut, they did whatever they could to agitate for strike action. In Melbourne, they distributed leaflets outside uh, the factory gates and so on, um, and they held meetings outside the factories as well before the strike. Uh, once it started, the communists cheered the strikers on in their newspapers. Um, I think I've got some. There we go. Um, and they, um, they celebrated the fact that young women were leading it. The CPA urged the textile workers to continue and they made arguments about what they thought would take the strike forward. In Melbourne, they handed out an enormous amount of leaflets. Um, they handed out flyers every day and estimated at the end of the strike that they'd handed out um, 23,000 altogether. Um, they also made every effort to speak at union meetings. And when the three young women uh, were sacked at Lincoln's for trying to shut off the mill motors, communists spent all night painting militant union slogans all over the factory walls. Um, and people, um, any Coburgers in the room? People from Coburg might know the site. Um, uh, it's, um, oh gosh, I just looked up the name of the street and it's clean out of my head, but it's near Batman Station. And it's now a shopping centre, but it's got like remnants of the old um, mill there, notably the chimney and there's a, you know, Quite there that you can see about the history. It probably doesn't say this bit, but um, that's you know, well, if people know the site, it gives you an idea of the scale. It's on uh, Gaffney Street, it's a shopping centre now. Um, yeah, so in Launceston, the CPA's membership was small. They had uh, at least one member, but I doubt they had more than six. But they did the same sort of thing. Um, they handed out a bulletin that was called the Lamp Pole News Sheet. Um, to the strikers. So all of their activity shows that the CPA saw this strike as really important. They took women's involvement in industrial action seriously. The textile workers won a partial victory. Let's go back to them. There we go. Um, <laughs> they won a partial victory in that um, all the bosses agreed to halve the wage cut. And in the circumstances, I reckon that's pretty good. And when the textile award was revised as a direct result of the strike in 1933, they got the 44 hour week for the first time. The workers involved considered this one of the gains of the strike and their experience, I reckon, backs up that old union saying, dare to struggle, dare to win. <laughs>
As for the Communist Party, unfortunately, over time, they traded in their radicalism for respectability. And um, Tom O'Lincoln writes all about this in his book about the CPA into the mainstream. Um, as part of that, they dropped their efforts, uh, at, you know, the Communist Party dropped their efforts to engage with women as class fighters and instead they only addressed them as housewives, which like, I reckon that's a real shame in light of their earlier approach in particular. Um, but of course, working class women didn't stop fighting. Um, in every generation, I reckon, there's been some women at least who've defied the stereotypes of being ladylike and all of society's rotten expectations. You've got um, just outside the Everett room upstairs that um, fabulous photo of uh, Zelda DiPrano chaining herself to the arbitration court and so on. So, yeah, plenty of other stuff. Um, so, yeah, plenty of women taking a militant stand, um, yeah, throughout the years. Um, thank you. <laughs>